So welcome everyone uh, to our uh, third um, series, third talk interview in our series. Um, my name's Suri Gupta and uh, really pleased to be sitting here with you, Sabuti. Um, again. again um, uh, Sabuti, as you know, is our president. He is the, um, really the founder of the London <coughs> Buddhist Centre. He was the first chair of the London Buddhist Centre and he comes uh, once or twice every year really and spends an intensive week with us um, and meeting lots of people, talking to lots of people uh, and really giving his sort of guidance and blessing really to, uh, to the centre. So we're very lucky to, to have him there and I'm very, I've been really enjoying uh, this time round. I always enjoy your visits and the rambles you give and this time round we've been having these interviews and uh, they've been really enjoyable and very different uh, as well. So. Um, the first day we had um, Subhadra Mati talking, um, the theme was why do I suffer? And, um, you know, and you talked about the different levels of suffering, the different types of suffering and how experience of suffering, sort of ordinary suffering in a way, like mm. that sort of restless sense that we get, that sort of bored <coughs> sense that we have, that there must be more, how mm. those experiences can be quite pivotal mm. to, well, can actually help us if we work with them creatively, mm. dharmically, help mm. us find the doorways to freedom. Mm. So that was a, come in, <laughs> get yourself settled. <coughs> There's a space here. A bit round the back here. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the, uh, still waving going on, okay, over there. <laughs> so that was day one. Um, and uh, yesterday, uh, Gus uh, interviewed you, and it was, is enlightenment possible, really possible? And, um, and in there, you sort of, you spoke about how the conceptual mind cannot understand enlightenment. Uh, it confound any attempts at trying to pin it down is confounded. Um, however, and this is where I wanted to start today, oh. really. Um, you did say yesterday uh, that even though you cannot sort of conceptually understand mm. it, right at the very beginning mm -hmm. of encountering the Dharma, mm. you had a taste mm. of enlightenment. Mm. Um, and, and obviously over the, la the next decades of practice, you've been basically understanding that, deepening it, having it more consistent as an experience. That was what I was, uh, well, you can, you can clarify what you meant there. <laughs> but certainly I was very fascinated by yeah. this original, this taste yeah. of enlightenment yeah. right from the very beginning. Yeah. And I wanted yeah. to start there. And then our theme today, just in case you're wondering where we're going, is um, how can I make the world a better place or how can I benefit the world? Yeah. Yeah, hmm. but let's start with this taste of mm. uh, enlightenment. Partly because as you were talking yesterday, mm. I I suddenly had my own ex mm. similar experiences, different mm. but similar experiences mm. to that, um, and I remember um, one of them. Well, firstly, I had it was a weekend retreat mm -hmm. where I was on, and I just I, my, I was so distracted all the way through the retreat, mm. apart from the very last meditation, and suddenly I thought. I got my mind got very absorbed and I just thought oh this is happiness I don't mm. actually have to look anywhere for happiness it's mm. here so mm. that was the first one but the major one that I had and this is why it particularly came to mind yesterday was because um it was at uh, York Hall when they had mm. the celebration of uh the death anniversary of but one of Bante's teachers Dada Rinpoche oh, and I'd only been involved two months oh. Uh, and I went along and they were doing this puja mm. and in the puja they had the Heart Sutra. So mm. if you haven't come across the Heart Sutra, it's very complex mm. text. I had no idea what it meant. Mm. Absolutely confounded mm. my intellectual mind. Mm. Um, it's like a foreign language. Mm. And yet at the same time, I knew that was the truth. Mm. And I knew I had to somehow mm. give myself to the truth. Mm. So this first taste of uh, enlightenment, mm. can you say more about that? Mm. And particularly, uh, what impact did it have on you initially? Hmm. What did you do with it? <laughs> yes. Well, in a, in a way, I could say that I've always had that taste in my mouth. I don't know how. It's only in hindsight that I realise I've always had it. But uh, it began to become a, a very powerful factor in my life um, around the time I, I finished at university. Uh, I have to admit that it was, to some extent, chemically induced. Um, <laughs> oh, you missed that out. <laughs> um, City Ratner will know all about that. But um, 
it uh, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend anybody else to do that but that sort of seemed to to bring something to the fore especially um, you, you know smoking weed in circumstances where one was very very quiet and I used to uh, imbibe the substances I used to inhale substances like Mr. Clinton didn't, um, <laughs> um, with, uh, as it happened, an American from San Francisco. And he, like none of the rest of us, used to just sit in complete silence in a darkened room and uh, smoke away. Usually we'd listen to music, but he just sat in complete silence. And uh, I had, from that, I think more from the silence than from the substance which merely focused me, had a very, very deep experience, which, uh, in a way, I can say my, under, my, my taste of the Dhamma is no different now mm. than what it was then. It's just got stronger, and I'm better able to keep it in my mouth than I was before. But it seems in some ways, with hindsight, mm. that it's sort of been there always, came really into consciousness at that time, and has just got steadier and deeper over time. Mm. What I did immediately with the next day, I went out and bought all the scriptures of all the major religions. I mentioned that the first night. And uh, I made nothing of all of them except for uh, the Buddhist scriptures, Gonza's Buddhist scriptures, and I think I mentioned on the first night. As uh, soon as I heard the Buddha talking through the, uh, the, the Gonza's translation of some Pali suttas, I, I, I knew of certainty that this was the truth, this man had experienced the truth, because it was the truth that I had experienced. I became also very fascinated by the, uh, the Book of the Dead, a short extract from the Book of the Dead, which is in that, that collection. And uh, what really struck me in, in the Book of the Dead, which many of you will know, but it's an account from the Tibetan tradition of what happens after death and how you in that after-death state, gain enlightenment if you want to, or at least keep your, get yourself as close to it as you possibly can. And the refrain behind it all the time is that whatever appears is but the projection of your own mind. And uh, this had a very deep resonance for me. So uh, it sort of went on from there and fairly quickly I, I decided I wanted to learn to meditate in order to stabilise that experience. I didn't really clearly distinguish between one religion <coughs> and another, and I tried a few different contexts, which, you know, very quickly I could tell this wasn't what I wanted, and eventually found myself in 14 Monmouth Street, in an underground basement in central London, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, so were there any... So I was thinking that when... Um, people go on retreats mm. um, and they sometimes have this big opening experience. Oh. Mm. Um, but the going back home or the going back right. to one's life can be quite intensely mm. challenging. Mm. So I wonder, did you have any challenges like that? You know, sort of practically, how did you work with, what did you do in terms of like following that experience? And were there any challenges in, in bringing, living it, living <laughs> something of it? My goodness, how many? Do you want me to give enumerate? Me, give me a few, give me a few. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I suppose the, the main thing was working out exactly what I should do. Mm. And I did go to, to speak to Sangharach, to Devante. I think that the second or third time I went to the, the centre and said, you know, I've really, I've really got this and I know this is what I must do with my life and I'm presuming that I must go to the East and that I must find you know, a monastery or a teacher in the East. And he simply said, well, you don't need to go to the East, and in fact, that may be simply more confusing for you, and that actually we've got everything here. Actually, we didn't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> Just a room full of people, and uh, one Sangrakshita. That was enough. And um, so I, I just kept up contact with him and kept going to classes, and. Uh, just slowly things began to unfold. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I was pretty free. I didn't have any, I didn't have a job, I didn't have a, didn't have a career. Uh, I, I'd um, you know, made my, my mind I wasn't gonna have a family. And uh, yes, so I was able to move with the unfolding opportunities. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and was there anything of that experience and what happened afterwards that was about benefiting others or contributing to the world in any way? 
I, I think from the, the very start, as soon as I really began to be clear that the Dhamma was the truth, <laughs> I, I felt that it should be shared, mm. that I should share it, probably to some extent from a slightly naive missionary proselytizing yeah. uh, as, aspiration, but you know, nonetheless a, a feeling that what I'd got wasn't just for me, it was for everybody. Mm. And uh, that was a very strong flavour of our movement in the early days, a, a strong sense that we should share it. I think it still is, mm. but mm. we're very strongly motivated to, uh, to spread the Dhamma. And as, as soon as I'd, I'd been ordained, in fact, before I was ordained, Deva Mitra and I started uh, teaching meditation in the main centre. Not even Mitras, because we didn't have Mitras in those days. You were never. You, you see, it shows, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, I think for me it was always bound up with uh, the fact that I myself could see this was what I needed to be doing, and so it seemed. I, I can't even say why. It just was obvious that this was what everybody should be doing, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps I was a little uh, naive in thinking that everybody was going to approach it in the same way as I did. Um, but nonetheless, it, it seemed to me bound up with the taste of, of, uh, of the Dhamma, that it wasn't just for me, it was for everybody. Yeah. So, because I was reflecting on the fact that, uh, you know, the first two questions we had in this, mm. in this series was, um, you know, why do I suffer? Right. So there's no person, human being on this planet who wants to suffer. I mean, it's yeah. kind of very yeah. intrinsic to our yeah. experience to, to do something about that. Yeah. Um, and the second one, yes, to, what do we do about that? Mm. But I thought the third, this third question is like, can I make the world a better place or how do I benefit mm. the world? Um, how, is that, is, how is that intrinsic to our experience? Is that intrinsic to our experience as a human being? Is that, mm. or, and or it is. Is, it, is it intrinsic <coughs> to us as being Buddhist? You know, how intrinsic is that as an experience to want to make the world a better make, place? Okay, um, well, I think it is intrinsic to the experience of, of, of the Dhamma. To the extent that you really experience the Dhamma, uh, you have gone a little bit beyond your own self-attachment. So you've begun to, as it were, be more objective. I don't mean that in the rational sense, but you've begun to look beyond your own subjective interest. By definition, it's intrinsic to the experience of uh, any degree of release from, uh, from selfishness, from self-absorption, self-interest. It just goes with it. Uh, because you then uh, are opened up, you're no longer so uh, uh, rigidly attached to one pole of the uh, of the, the dimensions of experience, the inner pole. You're you're beginning to be a little bit more aware of the the larger uh, field of, of awareness. So um, it seems to be simply not something you think about. Thinking will help you to ground that and to expand it, but it seems to be absolutely intrinsic to any degree of self-transcendence, because it's self-transcendence. Mm. And self-transcendence doesn't mean becoming a sort of blob. Um, it, your your self-transcendence takes you into a wider connection with the world around you. And uh, I suppose, again, I'd have to say this uh, in, in retrospect, I don't think I've thought about all this very much, it just seemed obvious. But in retrospect, uh, it seemed to me pretty obvious that if I was aware of other people's <coughs> suffering, I could not be free from suffering myself entirely because their suffering impinges upon me. Their, their, their ignorance, their, their, uh, the false trails that they follow impinges upon me, maybe not absolutely directly, but in, in terms of my awareness, in terms of my consciousness. And as I, I said on the first night, I've had a very lucky life. I was born into a privileged caste and uh, <coughs> I've suffered very little indeed uh, in, in any, any of the obvious ways. Of course, I thought I was suffering horribly. It was just my mum was a bit, bit much. But apart from that, um, um, it, it, it was pretty easy. Uh, and all, you know, I said every door I came up to just opened as I came up to it. Um, without any effort or struggle on my part, I assumed that other, that was a su true for everybody else, it's just because they weren't making enough effort. Um, but it, I began to realise it. Don't look at me. Like that. <laughs> 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 it's a glimpse of. <laughs> uh, 
uh, you began to realise it wasn't quite like that, mm. and uh, to encounter people who clearly that had not been their experience of life. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I moved within a privileged caste until a certain point in my life, mm. uh, when I began to reject that um, that you know class identity and consciously <coughs> try to to move beyond that for all all sorts of obscure reasons. But yeah, then I began to realise that other people really were not just lazy or stupid or ignorant mm. or whatever. Mm. Mm. Might uh, come back to the that okay. conditioning and the way you've worked with that because I think it's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, just uh, in terms of just we're just sort of laying the ground okay. here I think because I think so what <coughs> is, you've sort of um, identified for you is intrinsic to the experience that you yeah. had and you uh, and particularly re recognizing other people's suffering yeah. and that you knew there was a way, you know, you yeah. knew there was a yeah. way and for you yeah. to share that yeah. uh, with others felt natural, felt yeah. obvious to yes. you. Um, uh, but, um, your understanding of how you, because I was thinking about the question about, well, what do we mean by benefiting others or benefiting right. the world? Because some, mm. someone's mm. way of benefiting the others can actually mm. be uh, cause suffering. Tell, tell <laughs> so it, so yeah. were you at the time or how were you at the time sort of distinguishing, well, this is of true benefit and this isn't? Mm. How did you understand what real benefit was? Mm. Well, I, I just thought the Dhamma was the true benefit. Mm. Uh, and I, I realised that it took quite a while for me to realise that really mainly when I went to India, that uh, many people were not in a position to really practice the Dhamma because of their social circumstances and the, the cultural environment within which they lived. You know, the Dalits in India, and it's the same for the Gypsies in, uh, in Hungary that I'm, I'm uh, connected with. Uh, it, it's ridiculous to ask them to meditate straight off. It's, it's not fair because they haven't got the circumstances to be mm -hmm. f able, to, allowed to be fully responsible for themselves. The social circumstances deprive them of that. Responsibility, and you can't really practice the Dhamma unless you're fully, fully responsible for yourself. Some do remarkably well, mm. but uh, for many, it's just not possible. So, uh, I, I, I would have, I, I suppose, it's all a bit unthinking. Do you know what I mean? I didn't really think about all this. It just unfolded itself. So, to begin with, I'd have just thought everybody needs the Dhamma. They should all come to the LBC and learn meditation. Mm -hmm. Bus, that's it. And if they don't, it's their own silly fault. Um, I did begin to realise that you needed to try to attract them and, and um, to make it easy for them to, to, to come. Um, but I think I've, I've realised more recently we need to make even more effort than we do now, even in Britain, that we need to reach all the time beyond the, the settled um, circle that we naturally attract around us. So, um, yes, to... to to begin with, it was it was simply thinking that the Dhamma was, was what was for everybody, and it is for everybody. But that it was for for everybody in the way that it was for me. Um, but uh, I think I've become a little bit more sophisticated mm. because I've been extremely fortunate um, to find myself working with people who uh, really are very very much deprived of even the basic ground for practicing the Dhamma, mm. uh, and uh, I've come to appreciate that just becoming a, a, a full human being and claiming your human dignity is a huge step in the direction of the Dhamma. It is the Dhamma mm -hmm. in a certain sense, but that uh, it, 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 one, has, one cannot reject people because they don't meditate. Like sometimes I take people with me to uh, work in Hungary. It's not my work, but I support our, our mitras there. And uh, they, they always want to teach people to meditate. And uh, I've tried teaching a bunch of young gypsies to meditate and it's extremely embarrassing because they just giggle all the time and um, you know t make remarks about me behind my back which fortunately I can't understand because I don't speak Hungarian but um, you know fair enough I would be doing that if I came from their background um, so it's ridiculous that's not the place to start it has to start somewhere else so I think that I've become more sophisticated in my understanding that the principles of the Dhamma apply to everybody but those principles have to uh, be translated into the next step for the person you're dealing with do you see what i mean i'm not fitted to do that for everybody uh, because my own experience is not wide enough and my, i'm not particularly broadly um, versatile in that sort of way some people are much much better than me in that kind of way but uh, one needs to understand that the dhamma is for everybody but it's not for everybody in the 
in, in the same way. Mm. Uh, and that especially for people who are more marginalized, and there are a lot of them in this world, a hell of a lot of them in this world, uh, that the first step is by claiming personal responsibility and uh, accepting themselves as true human beings, mm -hmm. as equal human beings, as human beings. Mm -hmm. So that I see as the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. So in India, how did that sort of, what actually happened? Because well, you've been oh. really involved there. Mm. You, you sound like you've you, it really changed your perception about what benefit in the world or benefiting yes. is. Yeah. What actually happened in terms of the yeah. difference between here yeah. and there? Yeah, yeah. I, I should say that I owe my friends in India a great debt mm. because they've taught me to understand my own conditioning, mm. if you see what I mean, because I was facing people who had such a different background, so different. Uh, I, like when I first went to India, for several years I'd feel really lonely because I didn't know how to connect with people. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, that seemed as if they were very superficial. I've now come to understand that it was me that was very superficial. <laughs> uh, but, um, it, it, you know, it, it taught me to, to see how much I'm, I'm uh, reliant on, uh, you know, a, a, a relatively privileged, not greatly privileged, but basically privileged middle class background and parents who were always successful in the world and, uh, you know, going to expensive public schools where I got cold showers and bad food. My parents made a lot of money for that, um, but a very good education. Uh, and, uh, you know, a sort of sense of, um, uh, of my own potential, my own possibility. Mm. And it came to see that that's not the experience of everybody. It seems so obvious, doesn't it, now, but it wasn't obvious then. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it wasn't completely not obvious, but to a large extent. So I learned a great deal from that. But then uh, in India, um, because of Dr. Ambedkar, uh, people have a deep, deep feeling for the Dhamma, a very strong feeling for the Dhamma, because, because for them, through Dr. Ambedkar, it has been the means of claiming their humanity. Uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar, Baba Saheb, I can't stop calling him Baba Saheb, which is the, the name that they call him, you know, a, a, a loving honorific, if you see what I mean, a, a very lovely term. It means something like grandfather, uh, grandfather sir. Um, but um, they, they absolutely love Dr. Ambedkar. Sometimes people feel they worship him in an unhealthy way. I don't feel that. Um, they, they, he was a leader worthy of their trust. And uh, he said, our fight is a fight for human dignity. And he saw the Dhamma as the basis for human dignity. And he saw then further that the Dhamma was the, the basis for a free and just society. And um, so I've gone there um, to try to support my brothers and sisters in India who are followers of Dr. Ambedkar. Of course, we try to reach beyond that community, but it's still quite difficult because of the caste barriers to mix people from different backgrounds. But... Um, and of course that's one of the functions that somebody from outside that system can perform but then it's very difficult to integrate so you end up with a sort of apartheid movement mm. it's a great danger in Hungary too you end up with two different movements which I really don't want it's a, it's a denial of Sangha so yes I support them in their struggle uh, and especially what I've been focusing on I'm going to focus on much more is offering them well, much more depth in Dhamma experience. They can better do the, the social and political message because they come from that society and, it, and it, they understand what they're doing. I don't, I, I've been going to India for 30 years and I still don't really understand. And I still make horrible solecisms, um, in, in, many of which I don't even know. They're so tolerant and so hospitable that nobody will ever tell you that, will they? They just, they just let you make a silly ass of yourself <laughs> with, um, with a, with a, in a kindly sort of way, not, not out of showing you up. Uh, but yes, it's up to them really to uh, do the work of, of communicating with their brothers and sisters. I can help them a bit in communicating to people from a, a caste background that's more like mine. The, the, the large Indian middle class, which is usually upper caste. Caste and class are not the same, but caste often does coincide, upper caste, so-called, does often coincide with middle class, not altogether. And of course, there's now a large Buddhist middle class. But uh, yeah, I can help a bit there. 
But as people have got deeper and deeper into the Dhamma, they feel the need for a stronger experience of the Dhamma as individuals, not as a social and, and uh, psychological and, and political program, which is completely legitimate and we need to continue. But I can give them, help them to get that greater depth in meditation and study of the Dhamma, which they're not yet, well, they're getting near there, they're not yet able to produce for themselves. Mm. Not to the depth that I can bring it. Not, not long, I'm going to be redundant soon. Mm -hmm. But yes, so I, I've, I've tried to see what I can do if they, they, they want me always to make public talks and so forth because um, that I have prestige, if you see what I mean. So people will come because I'm there, a white man. And, uh, I was going to say, what's the basis of that prestige? Is well, it... it's complete, completely empty, but <laughs> it's the fact that I'm, I'm white and I'm, I'm a foreigner. <clears throat> Uh, it's probably the same if you're black and a, a, a foreigner, mm. probably more if you're white and a mm. foreigner, and probably mm. if you're white male and a foreigner. Mm. But, um, you know, one has to sort of sometimes take advantage of, of uh, completely accidental advantages. Um, so they want me to do that, but I feel more and more that actually I shouldn't do that, mm. that they should play, take mm. the, the forward position. And they are, they're able to. Mm. There's some, you know, uh, uh, there's order members in India, leading order members in India, who's as good as any anywhere. Mm and as dedicated and with as good a grasp of the Dhamma as any. And I've played my small part in bringing that about. Mm. 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 Gosh, so, so basically, I mean, you're one of the few order members, if the main order member actually, who have had this intensive connection with India and seen it grow through those years. There's yes. a few, but there's... Of course, there's Lokomitra, who's been there resident yeah. all that time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you've Karamaya. also been very deeply immersed yes. here. So can you say something about the difference you see between the ways we practice? Because what you've described there mm. is this sort of um, a way of practicing that really is able to reach out to yeah. people who wouldn't yeah. ordinarily, yeah. you know, study the Dharma. Yeah. What yeah. Do you, how, how are we different here? Yeah. Well, con uh, uh, caricaturing wildly, you could say that in, in India, uh, people, the, the, te the, the, the problem in India, or the rather the the tendency in India, the extreme to which mm. they go, is to be only concerned with social and political questions. Mm -hmm. They're just concerned with getting out of caste uh, at, 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 as, at, at, at their worst, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the pole that they tend to be most concerned with. What are we doing about this atrocity, that atrocity, right. the fact that you know, a huge Hindu mob attacked a big Buddhist celebration and several people were killed? Mm -hmm. What are we doing about that? So they'll tend to go that way. Mm. Here, people tend to be concerned about themselves and their own struggles and their own personal difficulties. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, of course, now straddle both, so I'm in the perfect position. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, yes, I think here we're still too self-absorbed. And in India, still, people do not still, not enough people fully realise that social and political change rest upon a much deeper change. Right, okay. So I, I think you know, caricaturing wildly mm -hmm. and different people have different experiences and so on, but that, that would be the general picture. Mm -hmm. And my Indian friends, when they come over, are really struck by it. Mm. It really stands out for them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it's one of Bhante's geniuses that he's created a movement which unites two such different cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, think, I know he saw that as educative because in being in contact with a, with the other culture you 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 uh, you have to round out mm. so indians tend to through their, their coming here tend if you like to become more individual because in a highly um, structured society with very very strong family uh, structure and uh, traditional structure and with with caste which makes uh, you know, you've got a large family which you have a, an intense loyalty to uh, and which is opposed to other castes. Not, not as simple as that, but again, caricaturing wildly. Uh, it's very <coughs> difficult to experience yourself separate. Mm. So you experience yourself as, uh, um, you know, part of that caste, that community, that family, and difficult to step beyond that. There are plenty who now do. Mm. And then in the West, it, 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 it's, it's easy for us not to realise that we are part of a larger whole, we're part of a society, uh, we're part of, a, of, of a, a human family, if you like, and that our own um, 
happiness and freedom uh, rest uh, inextricably upon uh, uh, attending to that. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. So, so cause I, when you're saying that, I'm like, I, I sort of completely resonate with that. Um, and I also know the experience that people often have, when, particularly when you're faced with the, how do I benefit the world or how oh. can I contribute, mm. is one of, uh, can be, there's different experiences, different emotional responses mm. to it. Yeah. And one of them can be, um, you know, I've got enough, I've got to sort out my own. Those yeah. first two questions, yeah. Yeah. my own suffering, yeah. and how do I free myself yeah. from it? How do I even just survive yeah. and get through my yeah. every day? Yeah. That's often yeah. what feel people, stops people from even thinking yeah. they can make a contribution. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose I would say that that, to, to, a, to a degree, is fair enough. Mm. I think it, it, if you tra- tra- start trying to benefit others in one way or another when you're not sufficiently sorted out yourself, what you do is you project your problems onto other people. And I've read somewhere quite recently that, that there's a, a known phenomenon that many uh, political active, social act- activists in, in the West, the study was done in England, the study was mm-hmm. done, uh, suffer from depression. So it's a way of, of uh, as it were, dealing with your own inner, inner disquiet <coughs> it, by trying to sort <coughs> things outside you. you no, know, jolly good, at least you're doing something, but you'd be able to do it much better if you, if you uh, work things out a bit more in yourself. So mm. I, I, I'm not, um, I don't deny that. And mm. in, in a way you could say it's the equal and opposite of, uh, of, of Dalits in India mm. or, or, or Roma in, in Hungary needing to get just a basic human dignity. So it's the obverse, right. do you see what I mean? That, uh, but then it has to begin to broaden out. Mm. And uh, anybody who does begin to get you know get beyond the, the basic stage of human dignity or you know reasonable psychological health and social health uh, will naturally begin to e- expand into the other sphere so i've seen it with with my my dalit friends and my, my roma friends too that at a certain point they begin to want to work much more on themselves mm. because they realize the limitations of what they do for others because of their own lack of uh, sorted outness, yeah. not 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 at the very basic level, but a, at a higher level. Yeah. So, for instance, um, Janos, who's uh, uh, the leading uh, gypsy Roma uh, Dhamma Mitra in uh, Mitra in Hungary, um, he said that when he encountered the, the Metta Bhavna, it just completely changed his whole social activist perspective, and it stopped being one of, you know hatred for Hungarians, which means white people, uh, it became something much more broad. He's still mainly concerned to get, you know, gypsies who are completely marginalised. By the way, they prefer to be called gypsies, but Tsigani, but uh, because Roma has the connotation of uh, a particular set who speak the Romani language. So I sometimes, it's better to speak of Roma because that's more commonly understood to be correct term, but I will slip occasionally. But... um, Yes, um, many Roma are, are, are strongly anti, anti-Hungarians, and you can completely understand why. Vice versa, of course, you can even understand to some extent why that happens too. But uh, you know, as you, as they, as like somebody like Janos realizes that that's not enough. He's got to look at the whole of society, although his main focus is on, on Roma. Right. Yeah. So those two poles of experience are sort of like, well, I need to sort myself out. Yeah. And the other one of kind of, well, I need to respond to the world, but then coming from a deeper base. Is that a sort of natural tension of a, oh, a yeah. practicing more and more deeply, yes. sort of going from oh, one yeah. to the other? And Oh, yeah. And I think that probably everybody will experience that tension mm. and, and work it out in different ways. You know, I tend to work extremely... Um, hard. Um, I like to do that. It's not because I have to. I like to do that. Engage myself very fully in in the work of, of you know, what it, doing what I can to benefit others. Uh, and um, uh, I like then to engage pretty intensively in in meditation and study in solitude. Mm. So I try to uh, uh, oscillate between the two. That works best for me. But others may need to do it in a more balanced. You know, Day by day, balanced way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but the two will need to be represented and will be represented and will be in some something of tension. I've been mentioning that until uh, three weeks ago, I was on solitary retreat. I'd been on solitary retreat for six months, 
fairly soon after I, I started my retreat, after I'd done a bit of basic sorting out of, um, you know, karma, um, I found myself faced with the, 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 the sort of thought, well, you know, what am I doing? Uh, there I was, I was reasonably happy, I was enjoying myself, but, you know, what's this got to do with anything? Mm. Uh, what's this got to do with the price of beans? Um, how does this affect anybody else? And I had to bring that into my solitude. That in my solitude I was trying to do something uh, in my own experience that I, I could then, that would bring me into a deeper connection with other people, mm. which hopefully would benefit them. Mm. Yeah. Could you say it's um, natural and intrinsic, this kind of as you go deeper there's a... Yeah. <clears throat> and Buddhism and can have a, a reputation of being um, sort of separate from the world, isolated from the world. So yeah. is it is it how mm. do we is it also a natural is it also a sort of risk or danger if you like mm. that we do get absorbed, yeah, reabsorbed back into sort of yeah. some kind of sense of self yeah. and not make that connection with yeah. the world. Yeah. Well, I think I think the dangers lie on both sides. Mm. The, the danger is that you know you you become a social activist or whatever and you do what may be good work but you never really attend to the the inner issues uh, and I think that's a strong temptation mm. which I see more commonly amongst Buddhists in India yeah uh, but not only uh, whereas you know more commonly one sees here people just become absorbed in their own practice and you even get uh, there's a bit of a a phase at the moment of insight talk and enlightenment talk in a way that I find a little uh, disturbing because it seems so much like my possession my insight my enlightenment where it seems to me insight and enlightenment are a very denial of the, the personal character of these things so I think that those the natural tendency it's not just the natural tendency from a Buddhist point of view it's the natural tension sorry tension from a Buddhist point of view it's a tension within life itself if you see what I mean the, the tension between self and other no which is, is just intrinsic to opening your eyes uh, because there's an inner, well, uh, in, in uh, some schools of Buddhism they talk about an inner perceiving dimension and an outward perceived dimension. And other people belong in the outer perceived dimension, but they're odd because they also have their own inner perceiving dimension. <laughs> Sorry if that's not getting too <laughs> elliptical. But um, uh, so it's intrinsic just to opening your eyes. There are all of you. Here is me, and uh, I cannot, I, I, unfortunately or unfortunately, I can't just close you all off, uh, and I can't just close myself off. So I, can, I can't resolve the tension uh, on its own level. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. The tension has to be resolved on a, on a level where these distinctions are only, um, only relative within a larger as it were, absolute field of, uh, of awareness. Okay, so... <laughs> oh, okay. Don't ask me what that means. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go back to where we were, which was... Which Feet was... <laughs> which was um, this sort of uh, tension between, um, you know, so, uh, well, the risk, the risk of... Um, potentially sort of getting more and more absorbed in your practice and somehow yeah. actually not making that transition to connecting with others. Right. And you're now talking about what actually goes on in the mind, yeah, or the structure yeah, of the mind, yeah, yeah, that yeah. sort of contributes to that tension. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it's inbuilt. It's, uh, in Buddhist terms, it's sahaja. It's born with us. Mm. This, this in, uh, absolutely intrinsic distinction between self and other. We're attached to a self in here and we're relating to a, 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 an other out there. Mm. And so there's a, a natural ten tension between the two. We want the other to conform to self's interest. Right. And at the same time, we often find that we're, we're dancing to the tune of other. Mm. So... Mm. Uh, we have to find a way to, to resolve that tension mm. and exist for everybody, Buddhist or not, as with everything that Buddhism deals with. Buddhism isn't a special department of human experience. It's a way of approaching human experience which helps to resolve it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this, this question of how I benefit or, or help yeah. others, how does that then, that tension, self and other, play out there? Uh, in Well, what I, was wanting, what I was wanting to find out <coughs> is how do we actually work with this Risk, because you talked about your solitary retreat and how you had yeah. to consciously 
bring some other yeah. dimension into the retreat yeah. to bridge that gap between yourself yes. and other. Yeah. So how do we, what do we do to kind of bring that into mind if it is a tension that we can just be reabsorbed into ourselves? Yeah. You know, or go out yeah. to other in a way that forgets <coughs> ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Forgets yeah. our, um, you know, that doesn't have the de depth to it. Yes, of course, to some extent, <clears throat> which, what, what one, which pole one is more likely to to fall into, can you fall into a pole? Get at get attached to. Um, it depends on many circumstances. Mm. It depends on character. It depends on genetics. It depends on culture, and so forth. It depends on the, the opportunities of life. Mm. Uh, you know, middle class existence often tends to self absorption, self interest. Not always, but because mm, yeah. uh, often the greatest philanthropists are from the middle classes. But mm. um, it, it, uh, your, your culture, to some extent, determines yeah, that, yeah. and the extent to which you've lived as part of a, of a, of a community. You know, like if you come from a family which is a very warm and, and uh, like you do, which is very, very close, then you're naturally relating to the world around you in, mm. in that sort of yeah. way. So all of those factors are there. But then, when it comes to practicing Buddhism, there's a question of views, yeah. of understanding. So what Buddhism does is it, it gives us ways of looking mm. at. The, the experience which is just given to us in, 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 by virtue of being conscious, it gives us ways of looking at that and unfolding it. And if you have a way of looking at it that uh, it, it puts all the focus simply on the, the inner dimension, that will be, tend to reinforce your own self-attachment. And some, especially Western Buddhists, do that. It's a, ten a tendency within Western Buddhism because Western Buddhism, by and large, comes out of the sort of therapeutic uh, um, sort of approach, mm. solving the problem of me. Um, so, yeah, yeah, the, the, the set and setting, the, 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 the ideas. Ideas are so important. They're far more important than we realise. Uh, and they do structure experience. They, they direct you into your experience in a certain way. Uh, and equally, you can have, uh, in, in with, within some schools of Buddhism, or rather within some uh, areas of Buddhism, which I saw, see more commonly in India, but elsewhere too in the East, you see an, uh, um, a doctrine, a, a view, set of views that privilege the outer work. And uh, you can tell it's not quite right, mm. because the person seems a bit unsorted, mm. if you see what I mean. Uh, so... Uh, that the, I think it's very important that we, in developing our Sangha, have a, a way of understanding the, the, the practice that we do that is uh, equivalent, mm. that it points in both directions, mm. and that allows people to move, you know, in terms of their own, own needs, as it were, between those, those uh, addressing those uh, poles, uh, but uh, which does very much um, keep both areas of work alive. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, to be topical, I, th I think a centre like this needs, you know, to have its meditation classes, its, its mitra study, its, its dharma talks and so forth. It needs to have those, you know, to, a, to the, an even greater degree. But I think it also needs to have some other aspect that reaches beyond, mm -hmm. um, not just by attracting people to the centre. I think one of those ways that reaches beyond is by trying to get to people who could benefit from the Dhamma, but who wouldn't step through the doors of a centre like this. We know all about that, don't we? <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I, I think that there needs to be that consciousness. How do we get more people to come in here who would not come here otherwise? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure they feel comfortable? I think, you know, yes. black people often didn't feel comfortable mm. because it's just a bunch of middle-class white boys. Mm -hmm. um, they need the Dhamma too, but mm. you need to make sure it actually is expressing an openness. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is good for you, mm. because it, it means you are becoming more open. But I'd like to suggest that um, we need to do something a bit more, a bit wider than that. Um, of course, my pet project is uh, my dear Roma friends, who struggle so much and have so little support. I'd love to see a centre like this with an active role in that. Mm. And, you know, some, some order members do come with me. But uh, you could imagine if a centre like this had a project like that, 
No, you know, had it in, the good thing about this is it's definitely, the, for instance, the school they run is a Buddhist school. Mm. Um, and it's the Dr. Ambedkar High School, it's called. So, you know, choosing a project that you can still connect it with your Buddhist aspirations, but it's, um, it's definitely stepping outside the usual sphere. Of course, you can do it. Uh, beneficial work in all sorts of ways. Yeah. You can be a doctor or a social worker or uh, or whatever, or collect food for a food bank, or all of that is great. But I think a centre almost needs to have that dimension very much alive within it. Mm. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn to the. To the, to the no, well, it's interesting about how you yeah. go about choosing. So there's a mm. few things about how we individually have mm. an have an impact on the world. Yeah. Um, coming from a dharmic perspective, yes. or using our practice to kind of you know have that yeah. positive effect and then how we collectively as a sangha have right. an, have a have, yeah. an, have an influence both seem important yes. i was just thinking about um some of the topical issues of the day right um you know climate change is big at the moment um you mentioned diversity um lot, there's lots of issues poverty yeah. violence in london yeah. Yeah. um how i just wondered how in terms of us sort of responding to those things whether we do that individually Huh. or collectively what do we need to be bearing in mind about how yeah. we go about it because you mentioned sure. views yeah and i just yeah. wanted to touch back on that a bit. yeah yeah well first of all i would say that i think if we can do it collectively we'll be much better at right. it we'll be much more effective uh, and uh, it, we, it we, we, we what we will take to people is not just you know uh, some food mm. but we'll give bring them a touch of sangha mm. right. but um yes i think that all the, the current issues uh, which concern people, um, uh, all have some basis. You know, there is a real problem that needs dealing with. But very often the ideas that surround the action that's taking place in relation to those are not ones that I can feel comfortable with. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I dare mention anything, but um, <laughs> um, uh, I think... It does. <laughs> well, let, let, let's take climate change. I think it's not a good thing to, to address climate change on the basis of, of, of anxiety and pressure. I think we have to have a positive approach, which may address what the anxiety is about, but I think it needs to be done on a highly positive basis. So we need to, for instance, take any of these issues and try to get to the dummic heart of it. Mm. What is the issue behind, from the dummic point of view, behind the problems of, I think it's more than climate change, is it? it's, it's environmental degradation in, in general. That, that's the real issue, is it, and which climate change is only part of. Um, so what is the issue uh, from a Buddhist point of view? And as we were discussing the other day, for me, it seems that the issue is that we are not uh, sufficiently aware of the world around us, of the natural world around us, as alive. Uh, we experience the natural world around us, and this is part of our materialist um, inheritance. We, we think of it as a, a machine, a machine that, well, what was it, the, the um, uh, 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 early Renaissance poet, uh, sorry, not poet at all, a pope, <laughs> um, declared that, um, that, that the world was for, existed for the benefit of humanity. Um, and you know, so that it was, it was for humanity to exploit the world for, for their benefit. Mm. Um, but that's not a very good way of looking at it, because it'll backfire. Whereas in contrast, the Tibetans will not cut the soil without... Uh, um, uh, you, you know, very careful preparation. Uh, they they consider that that the earth is alive. They consider that there's 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 spirit everywhere. If you see see what I mean, they uh, they will be careful about cutting trees. I've seen Tibetans at Bodh Gaya at night when the the lights are lit. Lots and lots of insects come, and you see them walking through the insects. They won't just walk over them, and. Uh, so they have a. Uh, uh, it, it's not. It's not something they're telling themselves. It's something they feel, that the, the world around them is alive. Of course, they conceive of that in animist terms that there are spirits everywhere. And they're not exactly wrong. It just doesn't quite suit our way of looking at it. But actually, the world is alive, uh, and uh, trees are alive. But uh, we conceive of it as being for our purpose, and then we exploit it, and we're astonished and surprised when it starts to 
backfire on us. And then we start to uh, make a fuss about it without often, not everybody, without addressing the fundamental issue of our relationship to life, life in its most, um, well, un a form that's furthest from, from our human consciousness, but for which we should feel something like metta, metta at that level. And I think that if, if as, a, as Buddhists, we may wish to address the, the specific issues of climate change, but I think we should be doing it on the basis of a, a sense of the world as, as, as alive, and we should be encouraging that kind of consciousness in others. Mm. What you actually do to do that, it's not my department. <laughs> I've, I've got other work to do. I'll leave that to you. Uh, but uh, and I'm not being flippant. It's mm. just that you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. But I think that those who are concerned about these issues need to try to go back to Buddhist basics. Mm. What does it mean uh, to be a Buddhist in relation to the natural world? And how, what... What would the you know what would the Buddha feel? You know the famous question: What would Jesus do? What would the Buddha feel in relation to this? And well, we know what the Buddha felt, because in the scriptures the Buddha lives in a, in a uh, an extremely positive relationship with the natural world around him. For instance, uh, the 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 monks nuns when they went into the three month rainy season retreat. One of the reasons for them to go into the rainy season retreat was because if they were walking around in the, in the rainy season, there's so many animals and you tread on them. And I know, I've, I've been to India in the rainy season and you do, you can't avoid it. So the part of the reason for that was reverence for life. Uh, and uh, the Buddha very notably uh, gained enlightenment under a tree. And you know what happened immediately after his enlightenment? He, after his enlightenment, he spent one week gazing at the tree just standing looking at the tree and one what what one's supposed to understand from that in gratitude in reverence to it that it had sheltered him and the rest of the time he was at Bodhgaya he sat under different trees so there are many many examples mm -hmm. of that like that and the Buddha of course moved in an animist world which he seemed to experience in that way and he experienced spirits and you know dryads mm -hmm. and naiads and all the same sort of things you get in Greek mythology. He experienced them, and he had a positive interaction with them, taught them the Dhamma. Mm. So uh, we need to sort of, we, we, can't, we can't start talking like that in this context, because it just sounds like uh, the pathetic fallacy. It just sounds like a uh, fantasy. Uh, but there's something within that, which is the sense of the world as alive, mm. and the sense of <clears throat> trees and animals and rocks mm. as having some sort of life mm. uh, uh, as manifesting life on their level that we manifest on ours mm. and you know when you're in something of a more um, uh, self uh, released state you feel that mm. you, you you feel the 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 life in the world around you so so the uh, so that you've got that's very um full uh, sort of response around climate change and environmental yeah. degradation about actually where some of the sort of Buddhist uh, views would come into yeah. us and actually really change the way we then yeah. communicate yeah. about it. Because I think yeah. the one thing about, you know, many of the causes, whatever yeah. it is, it arouses strong emotion yes. because Anger. it's, it's yeah. suffering. Yeah. Yeah. So it arouses strong emotion yeah. and then we then respond from that basis. Yes. Yeah. So how yeah. do we actually cultivate a dharmic yeah. basis for yeah. responding? Yeah. Well, I think that the fundamental thing is metta. Yeah. That's absolutely fundamental. And uh, I often tell a story of teaching um, metta bhavna in uh, Haryana, which is a, a very backward state, not so far from Delhi, with this extreme casteism. Casteism means... Uh, active uh, discrimination and and, uh, ra and uh, atrocity of a, an appalling kind, m most of which doesn't even reach press, doesn't reach the police. Uh, and uh, so I was asked to uh, um, meet with a group of Dalit Buddhists, and they actually did want me to teach meditation. So I came to teach <coughs> Metta Bhavna, and uh, I, I introduced the practice. When I got to the enemy stage, I could see that they weren't buying it. They were not buying it. And, and eventually somebody piped up, I'm not going to feel uh, meta for uh, those upper castes. I mean, I'm not going to laugh. Or what they've done to us. Are you asking me to, to thank them for what they've done to us? 
And I, you know, in my very English reasonable sort of way, tried to explain it, and I could see I was just getting nowhere, and it was getting worse. <laughs> my translator, who was very patiently translating my words, eventually got fed up, um, <laughs> and he just burst out. He, he just suddenly burst out, Maitri Majbute, Majbute! And Majbut means strong, mm. it's strength. And, uh, <laughs> okay, you just carry on. <laughs> 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 I'm too sort of <laughs> anyway he, um, and of course they just went oh yeah 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 great yeah fine yeah that's fine uh, and, and you know because because if you feel mitri you're, you're objective you can deal with the situation you know how to respond you're not going to make things worse you're not going to just go in opposition you're going to sort of skillfully work, work, work your way through it and um uh, I, I think that's the message. We, we, our meta needs to be brought into these situations of, of, of conflict and difficulty or of problem, uh, and we need to work out our strategy in relation to meta. Mm. And uh, we need to be careful that what we do promotes positive mental states and the kind of mental states will bring about a real change. Which doesn't mean you don't address the issue. But you address it from from a point of view of, of metta and of um, everybody presumably knows what metta means, loving kindness, uh, and you, uh, uh, you you try to make sure that well as much as you can you're working with people on that basis, and I think you're much more likely to succeed. In the short run, of course, a um, uh, uh, strength of, of feeling and even a uh, hot feeling is very powerful. There's a very, very good talk by Dr. Ambedkar, which was the last talk he gave, just um, about a month before he died. He was asked to address the World Fellowship of Buddhists conference in, uh, in um, Kathmandu. And, uh, of course, he'd just converted to Buddhism, so he was a real hero. And he was bringing, you know, so many, by then, millions of people into Buddhism for the first time. So they really wanted to hear what he had to say. So they uh, he gave one talk, which is about the conversion, and then they asked him to give another one, and uh, they asked him to address the question of uh, the Buddha or Karl Marx, because, um, because at that time, it was 1950s, uh, it, that was the direction that many marginalised people would turn. They'd turn to, to communism, to, to, to violent revolution, as a means of resolving their suffering, and one can completely sympathise. So he, he explored the differences between the Buddha's perspective and Karl Marx's perspective. He, he, he applauded uh, Marx and communism's aim. He said he shared that aim. But he'd come to, and, and to begin with, he did work with communists in, uh, in Bombay in, in, in union work. But he came to diverge from them as to means. And he, he says, you know, our, our means of, of changing is to invite people or give people the occasion voluntarily to change. We know that a change that is forced will not abide, and it'll turn simply into its, into its obverse, and that the, 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 the class or caste or whatever it is that was previously depri deprived will then become the oppressor, as we see in many situations in the world, um, in all the ironies of Israel and Palestine, for instance. Uh, so, um, you know, to to cut, cut through in, in a very caricatured way. But uh, so he said, well, the only way, only real change is a change on the basis of the Dhamma, uh, in, on ethical principles and in a positive way, which leaves the other person free. And then the change will be a lasting change. Then at the end, he said, people will say this is a, a, a tedious way, a long way. And uh, he said, it will be, it may be. But I am certain that it is the sure way uh, and that in the long run, this will work. Uh, and, and that is my credo. Yes. That's my political credo, if mm. you like. Mm. That I want to see a change that is deep and that uh, is, is deeply rooted in, in, in the experience of the individual and that is uh, based upon the most positive of principles and the principle of, of human growth and mm. ultimate perfectibility. Uh, and uh, I think Dr. Ambedkar is a very, very important source of, of uh, inspiration for us and of guidance, too, in this respect. 
Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Sabuti, and those really rousing words to we're seven oh, o'clock. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> just getting going. Oh, no. <laughs> just getting going. <laughs> <laughs> so rousing words to end. Um, and we've also within this, you've also yeah. given us some as a collective some things yeah. to be thinking about yes um as well so i really want to thank you very yeah. much really just for giving yourself yeah. um i love that you've said that this is what you stand by this yeah. is you know because yeah. i think in a way you demonstrate that yeah. through your work you go yeah. to very i mean hungary is a very challenging place <laughs> for to Not anyone for me, to go them. to yeah. Yeah. um and yeah. um you know you're putting yourself actually in in, yeah. in challenging situations yeah. now the yeah. um to actually have an effect yeah. um, and then to your sort of um, sort of intelligently and sensitively working mm. out what that effect mm. is and yeah. having to adapt along the way yeah, um, <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, I remember you telling me once it was sometimes quite humiliating you, <laughs> yeah. know, you, oh, yeah. you, you being there and I feel that that shows a lot yeah. for the fact yeah. that you're growing through this process, yeah. Yeah. you're changing and yeah. you're actually inspiring many of us yeah. in that yeah. way to, yeah. to follow on as well. So I want to thank you for the example right. that you set, yeah. the challenge that you give yeah. us. Yeah. Um, and the guidance yeah. as well, the Dharmic yeah. guidance as to how to make whatever we yeah. do long lasting yeah. and truly effective. Yeah. Um, Can so I put in one little thing that I ahead. wanted to go into? Go ahead. I'm not going to explore it very fully, but I just want to say it. I think it's very important that you don't think that you're just benefiting other people. Do you see what I mean? I think mm. if you go in with that in mind, it's going to backfire. Yeah. And you need to have it be aware that you're actually bringing about a human interchange in which you will gain greatly yes that, anyway sorry, which I is just also what you were too. you were also <laughs> yeah. sort of saying that about yeah. yourself yeah. about how mm. indebted you are to yes. uh, people in India because yes. yeah. they've actually helped yeah. you change yeah. and we didn't explore fully like yeah. that in detail yeah. but that's work that we yeah. can do yeah. so I want to thank you if you okay. want to hear more of Sabuti oh, uh, he's going to be <laughs> he's going to be here on Saturday yeah. um, with the transforming self and world group there and we're we going to be going into some of this I imagine I don't you know what bet actually, your life we yeah, are, yeah, in much more detail as well. So yeah. do come along to that, yeah. um, and you'll be around the rest of the week, uh, yeah. hanging out and meeting up with right. people. And yeah. um, so I want to thank you um, for giving of yourself. And actually, we want to give you oh. uh, something. And I also want to encourage you if you feel inspired. Actually, uh, and I hope you do, and sort of invigorated. Uh, by this series of conversations, um, we want to help Sabuti continue doing this work. Um, it's very important that you do this work. Very few people, in fact, no one I know, is doing this kind of work, going to India, hungry, coming back here, traveling around Sri Ratna, traveling, connecting with other Buddhists. Um, we want to help you continue that work. I'd like to invite you to help Sabuti continue that work. Um, and we, he gives himself freely. Uh, and I'd like you to help continue his work by um, you know, contributing to the dana uh, bowl on your way out. Um, it really does make a difference to to, to you, Sabuti, to, to be able to travel hmm. and teach and just be available hmm. um, uh, from this source of wisdom hmm. uh, that you've been cultivating and, and kindness, actually, hmm. over the years. So uh, let's give Sabuti something from ourselves first. Oh. And uh, to thank you. Yes, we've got another class starting soon, um, but please, as I said, um, you know, help yourself to the Dana Bowl. Well, not help yourself, give to the Dana Bowl. <laughs> give to the Dana Bowl and tap to donate. Um, oh, what is it? Wow. Oh. Gosh, <laughs> That's going to be appearing in a talk or so, yeah, isn't yeah, it? That's enough point. suffering um, there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you want to uh, help, uh, do we have to clear up this space or we leave it? Oh, we leave this space as it is, yeah. So thank you very much for coming. I've really appreciated your uh, presence here and uh, I'll see you around as well. Thank you. Thank you.